start recording. All right, guys, welcome to our Sobriety Engine Q&A. Um, I'm here with Cole Chance. She is our, I like to call you our resident spiritual coach here, um, because um, for those of you that don't know Cole or have never been to um, her guided meditation, those are held every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, and um, Cole does a 15-minute guided medica- meditation, and it's really nice. Um, and and some may not know that Cole is sober and um, has her own story into recovery. So, Cole, thank you so much for joining me today. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. I'm very well. Happy to be here. Good. Yeah. So I want to kind of jump right in because, um, you know, like we've talked, you know, a little, but I don't know like exactly, I I mean, I don't know a lot of your story and how you got to where you are today. You seem like such a spiritual person who you have your head on your shoulders. You're, uh, you're traveling the world, you're doing all sorts of different stuff, but I guess kind of where did your addiction start and how did you, how did you find sobriety? Oh, loaded. <laughs> what a loaded, loaded question, I know. <laughs> yeah, it, it's always so funny for me now, like when people meet me now and don't know me before. Um, yeah, like no one would have ever described me as, she's got a really level head on her shoulders. <laughs> or like, you know, some of these things, it's really interesting. Um, I, so I started drinking and using when I was about 13. Mm-hmm. And I remember kind of the way I describe it is like, I I feel like I had like a happy childhood. I didn't, it's kind of like I didn't know I was bored maybe. Hmm. Like I didn't know my life was black and white until I took my first drink and then my life turned into Technicolor and like every, all the color turned on kind of like in Wizard of Oz. Mm -hmm. And, um, it's a good analogy. Yeah. And yeah. I remember that I was having a little bit, I was starting to have a little bit of social anxiety. So it happened at the same time. So probably these like this, these preteen hormones coming in. And I remember that I had switched schools. So I switched schools from going to like smaller schools. And then when you like come into seventh or eighth grade, then like all mm-hmm. the schools come together. So mm-hmm. all of a sudden it was like 500 eighth graders when before it was like little schools. Yeah. And I re- never remember feeling like self-conscious until I went to this school. It's like all of this started happening. It was like the great reorganization, all this like hierarchy was happening, like the cool kids, the not cool kids, like sure. all, all this stuff was happening. And it was really, um, it was really stressful and really anxious. And I didn't know what anxiety was, but I just mm-hmm. remember being like, Oh, so it was kind of at that time. And I remember having, I remember a few bouts of like having some pretty bad anxiety of like wanting to speak and not being able to like, Mm-hmm. Yeah, some kind of interesting times with that and really wanting to be like fit in in certain groups. Yeah, and that's such an important time, you know, in, in yeah. a, a, a defining moment, I think, of like where we start to head into, you know, I mean, um, where we choose kind of what path, but we don't even realize it, you know? Definitely. Like, did not yeah. get a guidebook for this, you know? <laughs> no one does. Yeah. But it's interesting yeah. because, you know, our parents know that we go through it, but I think that by the time you're adults, you forget, like, how mm-hmm. important that is for mm-hmm. a kid, you know? Because it seems so, like, I'm try- like, I didn't make the cheerleading squad, and I, like, <laughs> wanted to shoot myself. You know what I mean? Like, these things, <laughs> right. and my parents are like, it's not that big of a deal. Right. But, like, they forget how big of a deal it is. Yeah, you, and you I know? think it's the, the feelings that you have around it. It's the um, yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. not what it is because they're right. little, they're stupid things like so and so gave me a note or whatever, the, <laughs> the boy, the whatever. Because it's, yeah. it feels so juvenile, you know, to talk about it now, but then not having any support around that because, mm. yeah, really, really interesting times. Uh, I don't wish back mm. for that at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, but so during this time, I remember I was at a friend's house and um, drank at her drink alcohol for the first time. And uh, I remember I was in her pool, like l- laying on a floaty and I was looking up at the stars and it's like I had got the golden ticket. And I remember I told myself that night, I clearly remember laying in that pool going, I'm going to do this forever. <laughs> yeah. Straight up, straight up. This was my new thing forever. Like this yeah. is it. Yeah. 
I and know. if I didn't try. <laughs> right, right. And that was that was the beginning. And, and so that was the beginning. And then, I mean, from there, it was just like, it was all the floodgates are open. Is that kind of how, Pr you know, pretty much it's like yeah. that became, um, what you kind of like obsess about during the week and then you mm -hmm. figure out whose parents are going to get it. You know, that kind of started that, but really what happened yeah. is I didn't, um, I don't feel like I had a lot of big trauma when I was younger, but very quickly I, I got it. Um, very, very quickly I got it after I started drinking. And mm -hmm. when I was like 14, so like later this year, I start sneaking out of the house. I have older boyfriend. And um, so, yeah, so I started sneaking out of the house to drink and things like this. And uh, the first time that I ever had sex, I got, got pregnant by my boyfriend. Mm. Wow. At 14. Wow. So that then, so then it's like, I was already going to be an alcoholic. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was already like on that path. But then I added that on top of it. And, and it that's, was like. That can be traumatic. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. I can't imagine. Yeah. It was important. Whew. Wow. And it was Oklahoma. Oh. Uh, with a, with, <laughs> yes. And my boyfriend was black in Oklahoma and it was, you know, it was just, it was not good. My parents yeah. are very Christian. Okay. Um, it was just, yeah, it was not good. Yeah. So I went and it, I went and had an abortion at 14 with like, um, you know, there's protesters wow. everywhere in Oklahoma. Um, I'm sure. Really, it was really like a movie. Um, and I kind of just blacked out, I think for a year or two, yeah. I just kind of dissociated. So that was the first time that I had done that. And somehow I directed all that anger towards myself, like towards my parents, especially my mm -hmm. mother. Mm -hmm. And you know, at that age, just like, you know, trauma is an undigested experience. Mm -hmm. Well, I couldn't digest that experience so that all of that sensation and the feeling and the angst that I had, I just gave it to her. Mm. Like I just made that the issue. Right, right. It, it was, um, it, it, the issue was at the time wasn't your abortion. It wasn't, you know, not making the cheerleading, but those feelings were still there, you know, and, and it was all leading up to something. And, and I can totally totally relate to that you know but but you don't realize it at the time mm, no not at all not at mm -hmm. all so that really started um a really big shame spiral as well mm -hmm. but um a re just the rebellion from that point on because then i had made this about my parents that i needed to get away right right that they're trolling me they're making choices for me they're you know all of this thing so then it was like everything that was away from them and they were very they're very um introverted very christian mm -hmm. and i was like <laughs> but they moved me they moved me after that they moved me a couple times because they moved me after that and then later in high school i was getting in lots of trouble again and um they moved me again so they would kind of mm -hmm kind of shift me around you know that look that geographical change. geographical change right that we I do learn it from my parents yeah okay. <laughs> and um of course it didn't work and so everywhere i would go i would just automatically find you know the people who were partying and and uh and go at it and very very quickly probably like i, I clearly remember in like probably 10th grade or something really formulaically figuring out how much i, I drank tequila i went through i've, I've had all the phases <laughs> Oof. Right. Great tequila phase where I'd like wear a cowboy hat and drink straight tequila with no taste. I don't know why, but I would very clearly um, figure out how much I could drink to get as drunk as I wanted without getting sick. So I was like really formulaically, you know, starting to um, starting to design how I can do this, and then maybe mm -hmm. I'll add a little bit of cocaine. Hmm. you know, and then all these other things start to come in. So start being, um, I start to be really strategic. I mean, mm -hmm. not strategic. We think we're strategic, but sure. I started being obsessive about it at, uh, at that age. Yeah. And, and I know, you know, for me, I thought of all the ways that I could continue my drinking and, you know, it was like, Oh, no drinking at work, even though eventually I did it, you know? And so 
all those ways eventually exhaust themselves out. Yeah. You know, and um, so I, I completely relate to that. <laughs> yeah. And you're always hopeful. You're like, oh, this is the new way I'm going to try. Like, this might, right. be, this might work. And right. It's going to work this time. Yeah. 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 So that kind of, that kind of carried on. I moved out of the house early. I went to college a little bit, but really I just partied. Like I couldn't make it to class and I started dating dealers. And so I'd have like cocaine around all the time. And I really prided myself in being like, I was always the youngest girl, the youngest person kind of. So yeah. I was really prided myself in the amount and my tolerance. Um, so weird things that we're proud of. And I just was really known. I'd really put this mask on and was really known for, um, how I partied mm -hmm. and um, just, a, just a lot of that it was complete debauchery. I, I was a kind of an all, I was an all day partier. Like I didn't take days off yeah. or anything like that, but I guess the next turning point would be, I remember when I was probably about 21, I think I'd moved to Santa Cruz in California. Okay. okay. Um, I had been living in like Lake of the Ozarks, Missouri. I don't know if you know where that is, but like, I, I uh, from from Ozark, the show. That's how I. Yes, that's where I went to high school. That's where my parents oh. accidentally moved me to. I mean, I I I only associate with the show, so that's... I haven't seen the show, but I hear that it's okay. pretty close. My dad's okay. best friend is the was the principal of one of the high schools there, so they moved me there so that the principal could kind of watch me. Right. And oh, then that's wow. where I figured out that's where I make all these dealers and all of these like. Right. Okay. So sounds about right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, but the next kind of turning point I remember, um, and I was really doing all, doing everything, um, all, all the different whatever was around, and I remember it being really glamorous too, because mm -hmm. like kind of maybe like I don't really know what the show is, but there everyone has yachts and there was like mm -hmm. big houses and like it felt really like it's like it affluent really and yeah yeah yeah. yeah. And it's like, we would, um, like we would be smoking cocaine, but we're not in a trailer. Like I didn't associate <laughs> smoking cocaine, but like on a yacht and yeah, just didn't, it didn't feel dirty. Um, it got, I mean, it eventually got there for sure, but. So I it was still, it was still socially okay. Right. I mean, and you're totally. we having fun and, 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 you know, it's, it sounds like, you know, just from hearing this, this much of your story, you're definitely running from something you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I, I started to move around a lot. I'd go to like Colorado in the winters to snowboard mm -hmm. and then back to the lake of those arcs in the summer and started kind of moving around. But at one point when I was probably 20 or 21, I, I remember, and I thought I was getting depressed. That's when I moved to Santa Cruz and I wasn't living mm -hmm. in, in tourist towns. I think it was a big part of it because the other two were tourist towns where it was very easy to wake up in the morning and have a mimosa or a Bloody Mary and like sure. say anything. Because yeah. everybody was. Yeah, yeah. When I moved to Santa Cruz, it's kind of like a normal town, essentially. And I didn't really know anyone out there. And I remember that I would feel kind of really depressed during the day. And I'd never really felt that feeling, like mm -hmm. this depression. And I started, I was shaking really bad in the mornings. And I remember thinking, like, I wasn't associating it with alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, and I just remember being like, there's just something, there's just something wrong. And then I started... Um, I don't know what made me think of it, but I started putting vodka in my, um, like in my orange juice in the morning mm. and I like, wouldn't tell my boyfriend and it fixed everything. And I was like, Oh, perfect. <laughs> Just another way, you know? Yeah. <laughs> that was the solution to my problem is I was going to start hiding vodka. Um, so that's, so that's what I did. And from that point on until, until I got sober about a decade later, I was a, I was an all day drinker. Mm. So as soon as I would wake up. Cause I was very physically, very physically addicted. Um, um, a few years later after that, I had a, my first seizure. I had a grand mal seizure due to, wow. um, I had to come home for my grandmother's funeral. So I wasn't drinking at the level that I was used to drinking cause I was having to hide it. And I didn't know that withdrawing or de like de it was withdrawing. Yeah. That, um, yeah. wow. That, would throw my body into um, a seizure. Wow. So Scary. on the day of my grandmother's funeral with all of my family in town, I had a seizure at my house. Everyone was staying at my parents' house wow. and they had to take me to the hospital. I had to stay there for a week. Oh. And um, they kept telling me it was, it, it was alcohol. It was alcohol. It was alcohol, you know? Yeah. Alcoholic. Everybody knows I'm an alcoholic except 
me. Except and you, I remember right. like finding <laughs> online like that that seizures can be induced by stress. Like one percent of seizures is like stress related. And I'm like, <laughs> grandmother's funeral. Like, get off my back. <laughs> right. Right. Like anything, so, any other reason except the reason, the actual reason, you know. Totally. Yeah. Like, and I believed it. I believed it. And um, so after that, I have that, uh, that fear mm -hmm. of the seizure and also that excuse. So for example, I would go through lots of cycles. I, I, I went to a few rehabs, I think by now too. Um, I don't, I wound up going to like six or seven rehabs like during yeah. my whole thing. So I had probably yeah. been, I think I'd been in and out of a couple by now, mm -hmm. but every time I would go, I didn't want to get sober. It's like I had hit a wall so hard or like hit a bottom so hard that I just wanted to feel better for a little bit. Mm, and then right. I would feel better. And then I would just like start plotting my doing return. it again. Yeah. I like drank on the plane home or it was just mm. like, yeah. not had no desire to get sober. I thought it would be horrible. I thought sobriety would be like I may as well just yeah. I, right. I told my therapist once just buy me a rocking chair then like I said that <laughs> that was my attitude I was like so entitled it's like a little piece of shit well then just buy me a rocking chair uh, I mean a crock pot too and some uh, knitting needles okay because yeah yeah, yeah. my life because I was young it's hard when you're young it's hard it is it is it, I I I got sober when I was 24 so I I okay. yeah I I know the and the first time I went to treatment I was 19 so I I totally get the being young and want it and not wanting to give into this you know but literally having a seizure I mean gosh crazy mm -hmm. yeah so wild and then, so the, the two things that that happened is, is that happened about that seizure is that, um, then I started, if I would wake up, you know, I'd wake up and I would be shaking, but mm -hmm. I would, I'd always have that fear. So I would need to drink. I need to just ma maintain now, even though mm -hmm. I like, already right. was, I wasn't doing right. it out of like a fear that I was going to have a seizure. So it's like, now I go to, I was, uh, anything I do, I have to have some sort of booze around me and I'm not like falling down drunk. I'm like highly functional, but I just have to have it in my system at all times. You're just maintaining, right? Yeah. Maintaining. Yeah. And then in the evenings I'm partying and then I'm maintaining all day. In the evening. <laughs> but then, so what happens often though, is like, I, I hit lots of walls. People always, you know, ask if one was rock bottom. I'm like, I think I had lots of them. Um, yeah. Very stubborn but I would hit these kind of bottoms or someone would help me or I'd go to detox or I would, uh, I would you know, swear off the alcohol. And what would happen is that uh, I would be like, I have to have more alcohol. Or if I'm with somebody who's supposed to be like watching me or helping me, I'm like, you have to get me more alcohol. Like I might die. Like I'm, I'm going to have to go to the hospital. I've had these seizures. So I start getting myself right. so anxious, not for nothing. Sure. You, you know, I experienced it before a seizure. Absolutely. Right. And so would work myself up so much into like this, the anxiety on top of it. And, um, and then, you know, other people would like cave people who were like trying to supposedly trying, you know, they were trying to help me. I was manipulating them right, to get me more alcohol. Um, it was just, it just got really, really messy. And I started mm. calling the ambulance on myself quite often. Wow. Wow. This was more up into the end, the last, the last, uh, the last year, because I would get, I would have be so anxious and I'd be shaking so much, um, mm. that, that I would often call, that I would call like 911 on myself wow. and they would, they would take me to the hospital. They try to get me, you know, clean. And I would nine times out of 10, this is how many times I did it. They blacklisted me from the Austin <laughs> ambulance. <laughs> They did. They blacklisted. <laughs> Why I wouldn't call a taxi? I don't know. I would call and an ambulance, and they ambulance rides are really expensive too. So that's on my credit. Once yeah. I did it in the morning, and then I did it later that night. Oh like, my gosh! Yeah. Same day. <laughs> that's the uh, insanity, you know. I mean, yeah. And I would get in there, and I'd be like, "I'm done. I'm done," you know. And like they would, would they would take what I really wanted was the benzos. I wanted the Xanax, or I wanted sure. 
something to quit the shaking and quit the anxiety because now on top of the withdrawal, it's the, the anxiousness, which all is, you know, looped together and, um, one big hot mess, you know what I mean? <laughs> one big hot mess. And yeah. they would, uh, and it normally what would happen is I would rip my IVs out and I would leave. Wow. And, um, they've had to handcuff me to the gurneys before because I would blow like 0.54. Oh my gosh. And they'd be like, you're trying to kill yourself is yeah. what they would say. But I would like be able to speak and remember it. And like, so the amount of the alcohol that I was putting in my system was completely, it was completely toxic. You should have been dead many times. I mean, and yeah. they would say that the doctor was like, you are very lucky that you're an alcoholic because otherwise you would be dead with this much alcohol mm -hmm. in your system. Mm -hmm. And, um, but that's what I kept then trying to feed. So right. it was like, what was my medicine was my poison. And because my body needed so much, I had to keep feeding it. Mm. Exactly. It was like this, this, uh, the cycle of, of I, yeah. Wow. So it's interesting because I don't, yeah, I don't, uh, I know lots of people are like binge drinkers. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people who, you know, like uh, that do it. Oh man. Yeah. I would just, was all, was all the time. And the withdrawals were so bad that I couldn't, I couldn't hang. I couldn't handle it. I had, um, I went to, so one of the rehabs that I went to, have you talked to anyone who's been to Narconon? <laughs> Scientology rehab? No, but I, I've heard many. <laughs> now I do. Now I know someone. <laughs> so strange. Oh. That's one of the, one of the many places that I went to. They, they boast really high success rates. So their right. online marketing is really, really high. And my parents were trying to do a, like a, a triage. So often I'd call them and I'm like, I'm in California or I'm in Colorado or something yeah. crazy happened. They'll fly to get me. They'll send me to sure. a triage center. That was kind okay. of the, that was the cycle of, of it. Yeah. And so one time my mom, like she's trying, is just looking online and this place looks great. It, you know, it doesn't <laughs> say it's Scientology or anything. Right. It just has outlandish uh, success rates on it. And so they send me there and um, they don't believe in any uh, medication. Huh. Uh, so they're detoxing me with nothing. They're giving me, um, they're giving me some, some vitamins. And I, I had full on DTs, delirium oh. tremors. I was hallucinating all week. I thought I was going to die. And that's what they are in trouble for is that they do have some, they have some people die in their detoxes. Oh, that's so it sad. Horrible. Like I cannot say how dangerous it is to come off of, of alcohol. Uh, that's so scary. And, you know, I mean, you didn't have to suffer those severe of symptoms you know yeah. i mean and and other people didn't but um wow i can't imagine you know i mean i've i've been through detox multiple times and um but never never like with just vitamins you know yeah man yeah. <laughs> so so, so hard what was the moment where you were like i i mean that defining moment where you just said i can't keep doing this because after you got out of there, did you have the same plan to go do, you know, go drink again and go do what you had been doing for all those years? After that one, yeah. I mean, I still yeah. did. I'm very, very hard case. What, what happened is a few years later, I, a few years later, I was at another treatment in Santa Cruz and that was the first place I ever took yoga. So that was the first yoga mm -hmm. class I ever took was in a treatment center in Santa Cruz. And I remember being like, hmm, like there's something to this. And I didn't plan on, on staying sober, but I remember saying to myself, if I ever get sober, which I'm not going to, I'm, I'm going to check this yoga thing out. Yeah. And it's like, I put it to this, I put it to the side. Sure. And I just remember feeling like so much there was something that was resonant with me there that wasn't in other places. I didn't really have words for it then, but th that really began to be a safe space for me. It is like this yoga mat where the things, the distractions were away. And I was just here with myself Yeah, and I was just having to be with whatever was there, whether it was good or whether it was bad or like whatever was happening. I didn't have anything to shove on top of it. Yeah, sure. And, um, 
that was so potent. And so I started going to like a yoga classes every now and again, I would kind of like play. I have like a little wine on my lip or whatever. And I'm like, go to a yoga class still. But so if I was pretty high functioning, I would go into yoga classes every okay. now and again. And then if I didn't, if I wasn't high functioning, then I might not be in there for like three or four months. Okay. But sure. Every time I made it back to my mat, it kind of felt like, um, it felt, it was like a safety buoy. Mm. And it was like, oh my gosh, I've made it back. And every time I unrolled my mat and I got in child pose, there was something about, something about getting on my mat and being like, I'm here. And it just, it, it was a, like those four corners of my mat just really symbolized something to me that I didn't have. Yeah. And um, so that was, that was working on one end. And then on the okay. other end, I had went to, um, on the other end, I had went and got sober in Austin after a different treatment okay. and had had my longest sobriety, which was about three months outside of treatment after a three month treatment. So I had about six months. And when I relapsed in Austin, I didn't know anybody except people in the recovery community. Mm. And so who I called were the people who I knew that had already relapsed. So it was kind of like, we so, were the, quite so they the could co-sign your, co-sign your bullshit, you know, for yeah. better. Yeah. So we were quite the Montley crew. Um, mm. And then I started uh, using heroin for the first time. Mm. At the, so the like about three months. Luckily, right. that's about that's about all it took. Um, about three months, um, and it just like real quick took me took me real quick. I overdosed. Mm. We were um, cocaine and heroin shooting, injecting cocaine and heroin, and um, I yeah I overdosed and had a stroke and. Mm when I kind of came to no one was there, you know, that story. And then I remember, I remember hearing years back talking to some, talking to someone at uh, talking to someone who was in recovery. And I remember asking her like, how do you do it? Like, really? I was clueless. Just like, really? How, Yeah. how did you do it? And I remember what she had said. Like, I remember that day and she said, one day you'll realize that you can be high or you can be happy mm. and that the two aren't going to go together anymore. And I realized that like, I, I loved the, the experience of substance and of alcohol and I was running from stuff. Absolutely. But I mm -hmm. also loved the sensation. I loved how sure. big it made me feel. I loved the way I felt like me. I felt like, uh, like I, I was in, it's so, it's so interesting. Cause I felt like I was embodied is about what I was going to say, but yeah. I'm absolutely not. That's the trick is that it was creating so much disconnection in me. But in the beginning, I feel connected. In when we end, wouldn't keep doing it if it wasn't right, you know, fun or made us feel some type of way, you know? Yeah. yeah. It's so sleazy and insidious. Yeah. And it's like, I just realized that like, I'm going to die. This was mm. not the plan. Cause I always in my head thought that, you know, how we have cliches around what addicts are or what alcoholics are is that I never saw myself as like a, um, like depressed or like had like a death wish or, I mean, I was totally acting like I did, but <laughs> right. I was, I was under the guise still that I was having fun, right. that I was partying. Well, and, and you're like, in here in the Ozarks, you know, I mean, we can see you're in your friend's pool looking up at the stars saying, this is, you know, the greatest thing I'm ever, I'm going to do the rest of my life. And you're in the Ozarks living it up. You know, I mean, there's no reason for you to think that, you know, you're not under a bridge with a paper bag, right. um, you know, until you have this life threatening moment of, okay, well, I had a seizure, right? Um, I'll like think about stopping, but not gonna. And then I'm having a stroke. I mean, and it takes someone to just that moment of clarity, you know, do you want to be high or do you want to be happy? Oh, I love that. <laughs> and that's what it was. That's what it yeah. was. Is that, I, that came into my mind. She, she had told, I don't even remember how long prior. It's so interesting. Like one thing we say to somebody may mm -hmm. be the thing that mm -hmm. changes it. I, I don't even remember who she was. I wish I knew. Um, but I was like, I'm not trying to die here. <laughs> like I'm not trying yeah. to die and I'm going to, yeah. I don't have any more cards to play. Um, and 
so I called a, I called a, um, a sober living place that I had been kicked out of prior in Austin. Hmm. And they were the one sober living place in Austin that was high risk, meaning that they'll take you even though you don't, aren't coming out of rehab. Like they'll take okay. you like 24 hours sober. It's the only yeah. place in Austin. I had just been kicked out of it not very long before this. <laughs> and I didn't have any money. And um, my parents wouldn't talk to me. They hadn't talked to me for a while. No one would, no one was giving me anything anymore. Long past that. I couldn't get in any treatment centers in Austin. They're like, what are we going to teach you? Ambulance won't pick me up. Right. I mean, like literally everyone had to, like stop, which is so right. good. And you hear which story over and over. Yeah. It's like, everybody just stop. Like, <laughs> and then I was like, I have to do it. Right. <laughs> and I'm, I'm You're responsible for yourself my, now all of a sudden. Yeah. I'm saying this with a smile on my face, but it was fucking terrifying. Yeah. And I was like, but there's something that piece of empowerment that we need to say, I have to do something mm -hmm. rather than, you know, having somebody come and pick me up off the ground. Mm -hmm. And I called back the sober living place and they had no reason to let me back in. I was a, you know, a danger to really the other, the other girls that were in the house. And, um, I called and I said, I'm done. And no one's ever heard me really say that before. It's normally I'd been like shoved in places, mandated. And um, they said, come on, come on Wednesday, which was like three days. And I was like, oh, okay. and um, I showed up, you know, I had to, I showed up on Tuesday night with my bag and I just said, I'll sleep on your couch. And they were like, come in. And I wow. just like, <sighs> like, it felt like, as like a zillion pounds came off of me. Mm. And I mean, it still gives me goosebumps to think about it. And from that, from that moment, the feeling, the, the ability to be with community and to be, you know, in that, the ability of wanting something. And I don't even know if I really wanted it. I just knew I had that, knew I had to yeah. do something different. I wasn't excited about it. Um, and the, but the desire to do something different and the fact that I was, in a space where I, people spoke my language. Mm. Like that sober absolutely. living place saved my life. Absolutely saved my life. Huh. And I started almost immediately, uh, I found like a yoga studio. Thank goodness. Okay. Yoga I was going to ask about that. Yeah. They do those like 30 days for free or whatever. Cause sure. I don't have any money. And I did a 30 days for free and I just went like a maniac. I just went over and over and over again. And I remember when I made it back on my mat that first class, um, I was in this huge room. There's probably like, I don't know, 80, hundred people in there. And I unrolled my mat and I got in child pose and I just like ugly cried, like, bah! like I made it back and I was so scared that I was so felt so hopeful that I made it back. And I was also terrified that I knew that if I didn't stay there, that I, I was, I was going to die. Yeah. And I just, I just kept, I just kept coming mm. back. And that was so big for me. Yeah. There's wow. been so empowering about that practice. So then how did you end up, I mean, and I have a couple directions I want to go with this, but how did you end up, you know, deciding this is what I want to do with my life and, um, that it was that big of a part of your recovery, you know, I mean, how, how did you come to that decision? It's kind of like, I knew that it would be, I knew that it would be, I had like a premonition whenever I, whenever I did that class, probably four or five years earlier, or I don't remember when, but it was really interesting, but pretty, pretty quickly, I knew how different I would feel. Like, I remember like drinking before class, going to a yoga class. And then like, after, I don't know, just like the juxtaposition of mm. the two sides of myself. Yeah. So whenever I started going to the classes, I was really lucky to have really good teachers who did lots of like self-inquiry questions and lots of like, okay, like reflection questions. and yeah. Yeah. So it wasn't just, it wasn't just physical, but the physical was needed too. Um, sure. Of like, put your right hand on your left foot. I was like, what? <laughs> You know, like, so disconnected, but all of these things go together. Like, yeah, our mind is one thing, but our body, you know, needing, needing to move and open and to release. And I just, I, I got my teacher training at that studio um, okay. later that year. Okay. And that was one of the first spaces that I was in 
that community spaces that I was in other than like going to meetings or, um, yeah, that was like one of the first more of like, a, it was like a mixed group, you know, sure. thing with, with some normal people. And I remember saying that I used to never talk about my addiction. I would never say that I was in recovery. I just thought, I don't know what I thought. I thought the world would, would split open if I told people that like I didn't drink, <laughs> but I, I, it's like, I realized that if I didn't tell people then I was going to keep drinking because I relapsed yeah. a lot because someone would offer me a drink and I would like, couldn't say no. And I'd be like, mm. okay. Um, and I remember telling my group whenever we were like introducing each other, like at the beginning of the yoga thing. And I remember being like, I'm in recovery. I don't drink or like yeah. and really being able to. So you set that tone and from the very beginning. Yeah. And, and I think it's super important, you know, for, for especially those that are, that are new or that are watching the replay or that are here for those that are like, you know, yoga and, and what you're doing, that's your thing. You know, I don't per se, like finding your something that you hold so close to yourself that, you know, either has saved you or just makes you, you're so passionate about. Um, because like I do, I, I, I'm in your yoga tribe. Okay. So I like practice <laughs> here, you know, I, I practice yoga with you and it's so like seeing you be uh, passionate about it on Instagram and, and everywhere else. I mean, it's just so, um, and, and for me, that's writing, you know, like I write all the time and, um, I, I just think that is so important and so vital to maintaining, you know, part, a part of maintaining recovery. Yeah. Definitely, because, you know, the amount of energy that we spend on our addiction is astronomical. Like, the amount of time that I spent thinking about whether I smell like it, where I'm going to get more, how I'm going to, you know, whatever, is astronomical. And that doesn't go away. Like, that that goes away. That does go away. Yeah. Right, I said that wrong. That goes away. But that energy, like, then it's like, it needs to do something. Mm -hmm. Like, it needs to do something else. So I was able and really lucky to find, um, to find yoga that I, that I loved it so much. And I was able to shift that energy over there. Mm. I think that if I didn't find that, it makes me wonder what it would have been for me. Um, yeah. and, you know, some people it's running or it's gardening or it's writing, or you go back sure. to school, something that you're passionate about, but just not drinking or is not going to do it because right. that all bubbling, that energy is like mm. frenetic. And yeah. it's like needing and to do something. So true. And, 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 you know, I, I, for me, I thought, oh, well, like sobriety would be so boring, you know, yeah. but it's the least boring thing I've ever experienced in my life because life happens, you know, and we have to find other ways to deal with life. Um, and what an experience that is, you know, without drinking or, or using. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so. absolutely not boring. Yeah. So, and you have been, how many country, I mean, since you've gotten sober, you've been to crazy amounts of different places. You're a, I don't know, uh, yoga nomad, you know, like uh, traveling all over the, the globe. You know, um, my whole life I've wanted to travel. So I was born yeah. in Oklahoma, in this tiny little yeah. town. And so I always had these big, you know, dreams of traveling the world and I was never able to get out of the country because I was well thank goodness I never was able to right right after I got sober and I was a massage therapist already so one of my okay. breaks in sobriety I went back to massage therapy school because I was bartending I bartended during my whole addiction but no one would let me bartend good call sure yeah so during during one part of this I'd gotten a massage training so I did Thai massage and I worked at some spas okay. and like this so I, when I added that with yoga, um, I got really fortunate in somebody, some, a friend of a friend said I needed to meet somebody who was doing Thai massage and she was teaching a retreat in Thailand and she needed an assistant. Hmm. So she asked me, um, if I would come and be her assistant in Thailand for this, uh, for this Thai massage and yoga retreat. So that was my, oh, yeah. First, <laughs> yeah, that was my first trip. And from that, I went back with her the next year. I was able to begin to see the back end, like the way mm -hmm. that retreats and stuff worked. Mm -hmm. And um, I was like, I can do this. And started putting them together, like relatively, mm -hmm. yeah, relatively yeah. quickly. Wow. Within a couple of years. Within, within two years, I was traveling full-time, I think. Wow. 
I started teaching in Austin um, on Yoga TX. This was another mm -hmm. thing that was really synchronistic is that somebody asked me, it was an ad on Craigslist. This is so funny. No, it was an ad on Craigslist. I don't have any money I'm broke. I'm just trying to stay sober. And, but I have this teacher training and I just graduated from my teacher training. I don't really know what I'm doing. And I saw this ad on Craigslist about teaching yoga. And I never thought anyone would ever, ever watch it. I thought that I would have a resume. I would be able to use a video for a resume. Right, I was like, okay. oh, he'll, he'll film me doing yoga and I'll send it to, you know, places. And people started watching on YouTube. And it was like, oh my gosh, Love my it. first video that I ever did has like 4 million views on it. Oh my God. That's like, amazing. Unbelievable. And that, that, that is really what, um, is really what shifted me into what I do now. Like that mm -hmm. kind of feels like really lucky, but, mm -hmm. um, that synchronicity mm -hmm. has allowed me to, um, I, like I grew on that channel. Like I went from like, and I think that's why people always say you're so approachable. It's like, because I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> right. Right. You no, know? I hope I'm still approachable, but I also, um, like I wasn't like, Oh, or I wasn't like really <laughs> polished. Sure. Like was, holier than thou or whatever. Yeah, you know? I mean, yeah. 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 I was wow. just terrified. I didn't know what I was doing, uh, <laughs> but it just, it just worked and it was, you know, it was really authentic and it wasn't staged at all. And, that really, um, yeah, yeah. Wow. And, Just, and it truly is, you know, a testament, I mean, of, you know, in Santa Cruz, just drinking and doing yoga, you know, and now here you are, 4 million views on, on um, YouTube, you know, on, on uh, Yoga TX. I mean, it just shows like what we, we have so much more power than we think, you know. Yeah. And, Our capability. Um, the capability that we have is immense and it's just when it's used in the right direction, like we are capable yeah. of destroying ourselves and we're also yeah. capable of, you know, so much expansion. Ooh. So, and, and now that we're talking about this, I kind of want to talk about, cause you just launched, um, your, your program for mm -hmm. your drug and alcohol, um, you know, program for people who are struggling. Um, so first, like, how did you, come up with the idea and um because i i just love this uh and and i guess what is it because i already know what it is so <laughs> yeah so it's called emerge and it's something that i've been wanting to do for a really long time because i guess i was never traditional in any sense of the word and what really resonated for me was whenever people took like these different ideas and it was wrapped in a different like in a different package like of it was really hard. It was actually really hard for me to digest the 12 steps until I had a teacher who did it in yoga terms. So I went to a training wow. called the, the yoga of the 12 steps. Her name is Nikki Meyer. She's amazing. And she, I was always like mm, 12 steps, 12 steps. And then she, <laughs> she told me about the 12 steps and just did it in yoga terms. And she's like, and I'm like, Oh my God, it's the same. Yeah. It's just because it's that rebellion in me. Right. I didn't want to digest it that way. So and I think that that's really common for a lot of people. So I think, so this program is, um, it uses, we'll look at, you know, addiction through uh, the Buddhist philosophy, through yoga philosophy, uh, mindfulness. There's, uh, we'll look at, um, explore mudras and meditation and mantras. We'll use lots of different things, lots of self-inquiry, because that's been probably one of the biggest parts of my, um, mm -hmm. biggest parts of my journey is just the questioning, the questioning and the honestly looking and, um, doing this kind of self, this self seeking. And we'll do that together as together as a group. And there's of I course yoga that. classes and it'll be kind of all blended up. And my hope is that, you know, not everything is going to resonate with everyone, but somebody sure. that I think that it's so much thing, somebody's going to be like that, like that is so interesting to me. And that makes sense. Yeah. And, um, so that's, I, I love, I love that. And I think, you know, when I, for, when I got sober, it was like, you have to do it this way. You have to do this way. And, and same as you, I was like, F, you know, F off, like I'm not doing it this way. Like, and, and now in this day and age with everything online now, it's, it's so, there's so many more different options that, um, that people can have. And, yeah. and I love that. Um, so, and I just have a question for you too. Um, if someone, 
I guess it, who's getting sober wanted to start doing yoga or meditation and um, where would they begin? Um, so everyone's a little bit different. So I started going into the studio first, first mm -hmm. off, but I know that's not a lot of people, you know, would rather not do that. That's very common that people would rather do yoga at home, but here to plug myself, I have hundreds of videos <laughs> online and you can just type in my name, Cole Chance. I have lots of videos and they're very, um, they're very diverse uh, beginners, yoga, uh, gentle yoga, all the way up to, um, kind of the more, the quicker vinyasa. But I think that um, whether it's a yoga practice or it's a meditation practice or um, some of the some of the mindfulness groups like Refuge Recovery, some of the mm -hmm. some of the Buddhist meetings are so incredible. Mm -hmm. Just to just to get a look at uh, at some different components, I think is so important that we have really diverse toolboxes. Yeah, that it's not just it's not just one thing that we that we utilize different things and just to show up and be curious. You don't have to be flexible. You don't have to be. You just have to be mentally flexible a little bit. You know, when I started doing yoga and going into the studio, I was so self conscious about. Yeah. I mean, because you know, you I'm like, oh god, like this person can pretzel themselves. I can do. I mean, that's uh, so common. Yeah. So yeah. common. Like I have so many people. I have a lot of people who come on my retreats that uh and they're like i've never been to a yoga class i only do yoga with you and i'm like oh like it's so sweet but i'm like i'm going to get you into class too yeah um, because we have the the marketing of yoga has created such you know such a bubble of like this is what it looks like um and it looks like everything and i i am really flexible i was like a gymnast and stuff when i was younger but um i can assure you that it's not it's absolutely not mandatory or required or what, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, very, well, very, and it's so much more, the philosophy behind it is like, oh, it, it's really, really mm. beautiful. And it's so beneficial. And yeah, it's definitely not just, well, it's story. definitely, you know, save it sound, sounds like it saved your life. Um, yeah. and, and, you know, I know you're into, you know, um, Buddhism and, and, um, and that could be a whole nother conversation and I don't want to, you know, keep you, but I just so appreciate you, you know, being here and sharing your story with us because, um, you know, there's uh, so much that I didn't know about you and, and so much that I can relate to. Um, and I just totally believe in everything that you're doing and, um, you know, I just want to hold that space for you and, and support you because it's, it's so important that, you know, I mean, in recovery and we all are together on this journey, you know, and, and it's just one big experience and we're all trying to have the same outcome. Um, yeah. So, so for those of you that are here, for those of you who are watching, if you want to, where, where can we find you? <laughs> Coldchanceyoga.com. That'll have all the things on it, all the, the videos or the retreats or the, um, the recovery program, all the different things are on. And you can also catch Cole on Mondays <laughs> at 6 p.m. Hi. Right here. Yeah, right here. And right here. so check out the events page on Sobriety Engine. Um, if you want to uh, be at our live pattern meditations, and then we also record them. And or if you want to just ask Cole a question too, show up. So, yeah. well, I appreciate it. I, it's the morning to you. So have a great day. And, um, and oh, Chris is here too. He said, you may be free because that was <laughs> one of the, the meditations we did. Um, the meta yeah. yeah meta yeah beautiful well thank you Cole and I hope you have a great day and I'll, we will see you on uh on Monday yeah sounds good all right all right okay. bye, bye.